Hunter Biden is speaking out for the first time since the Ukraine controversy erupted. Take a listen. No, in, in retrospect, look, I, I, I think that it was poor judgment on my part is that I think that it was poor judgment because I don't believe now when I look back on it. I know that there was no, did nothing wrong at all. However, was it poor judgment to be in the middle of something that is a it, it's a it's a swamp in, in, in many ways? Yeah. And so I take I take um, full responsibility for that. Do I did I do anything improper? No, in, not in any way, not in any way whatsoever. He used the word swamp to describe where he was doing work there. I have to believe that is language this morning that the Biden campaign headquarters may not be pleased with. Well, that play on words could be deadly, uh, politically deadly. Um, this comment from Hunter Biden is going to hang over that debate tonight uh, like an albatross around the debate stage's neck, the, de the Democrats, as well more so uh, for Joe Biden himself. Look, this comes at a bad time because you have a lot of Americans who are very upset with this nepotism issue when it comes to the president of the United States. And now you have one of the leading candidates, yeah. if not the leading candidate for the Democratic side, having issues with his son involved in some almost something similar to what yeah, possibly is with yeah, the foreign president. Foreign conflicts but, of interest. I mean, a conflict is, of interest if, when their fathers are in the White but, House or but, vice but president. Democrats, but Democrats, we just have these conniption fits whenever you begin to criticize or critique mm -hmm. one of our own because we have flashbacks to 2016. The Tell fact, the truth and the, shame the devil. The fact is this. This was, this, this was optically poor, mm -hmm. to say the least. To, to go and take this job with the Ukrainian gas company was just awful. Joe Biden, I mean, uh, Hunter Biden acknowledged that. Um, I actually compare it to Hillary Clinton's server, right? I, I say that it was, it was wrong. It was something that shouldn't be done. No, it's not illegal. No, it's not really unethical. But optically, it looks really, really yeah. bad. And we should make better decisions than that. But Democrats, they're going to get on that stage tonight. And the Biden campaign has framed it that no one can bring this up. How dare you bring this up? How, dare you, up? how dare you talk about Hunter Biden? Nobody's talking about Hunter Biden other than to say that he should not have done this, which he acknowledges himself. This safe of secrets. We had heard rumors that the uh, National Enquirer and or its parent company, AMI, had a safe of secrets where they kept stories on Donald Trump, who was then a candidate. We also document multiple sourced documented accounts of a destruction of evidence before the election. They were shredded. There is uh, an incident in the days before the 2016 election where we have employees saying that Dylan Howard, this senior AMI official, ordered documents to be removed from a safe and shredded. Okay, so now tell us, what was on that list? What was in that safe? So, you know, as with so many AMI stories, the story is about the process. The story is about the collaboration between Trump and this outlet and whether it violated election law. Obviously, AMI has signed a non-prosecution agreement admitting to potential violations of election law. Okay, here's what AMI says about this, about you. Mr. Farrow's narrative is driven by unsubstantiated allegations from questionable sources, and while these stories may be dramatic, they are completely untrue. I'll let the reporting in the book stand on its own. We're extremely confident in it, and those denials are included very clearly in the book. It's very fair. It's very meticulously fact-checked. Damaging information that could have been helpful to voters during the 2016 election was stored in a safe and or killed by the National Enquirer. And just quickly, wouldn't it have helped them sell magazines if they'd put that out? Why did they do that? Well, this is one of the curious narratives of that election cycle, that the Enquirer became an attack dog for Donald Trump. They have admitted that this was a coordinated collaboration, not only killing stories, but also actively going after leads to try to buy and bury them. Uh, here is what Dylan Howard's lawyer says about this, so this was the editor at the National Enquirer, quote, we have advised Mr. Howard to make no further comment at this stage all, while all legal options and jurisdictions are being considered. Every major national, international, and local news operation that's looked into it has said it's a lie. This is the president's flat line, number one. Number two, the statement my son put out today, which I saw when he put it out, I was told there was one being put out. I did not consult with him about what was being put out. In fact, represents the kind of man of integrity he is and what, in fact, he has done 
and why he stepped down. And I can tell you now, if I am your president, next president, I'm going to build on the squeaky clean, transparent environment that we had in the Obama-Biden White House. And no one in my family or associated with me will be involved in any foreign operation whatsoever, period. End of story. Now, let's focus on the problem. The problem is we have a president who violated his oath. He's invited, not just relating to me, on three occasions, he's gone to foreign governments and asked for their input in a domestic election. The Russians, the Chinese, and the Ukrainians. And there's not a single shred of evidence to suggest anything I did was wrong. I enforced the policy of the United States government, backed up by the IMF, backed up by the EU, and backed up by all our allies to clean up the corruption and fire a prosecutor who was corrupt, period. I never, ever, 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 ever had a conversation with my son about anything that I was doing. In the hottest Alaskan summer on record, amid countless signs of a climate in crisis, a camera phone captured a Republican fundraiser on Kenai Peninsula, not far from the Swan Lake fire, now burning for over three months. The President of the United States cares about Alaska. With about Donald Trump on speaker, that is Alaskan Senator Dan Sullivan holding the phone and swatting at hornets. Mississippi Senator Roger Wicker nods and smiles as the president promises to help them drill for oil in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge up north and build a road through protected habitat in the south. Cove Road. King Cove Road, yes sir. And then Governor Mike Dunleavy enters the picture. He's been bonding with Trump during Air Force One refueling stops. Everything can work with us on our mining concerns, timber concerns. Often bringing a wish list of rules and regulations he wants overturned in the interest of creating new industry. He's a great guy and he's, uh, he's doing something with your login and all of your other things. We're working on that together and that's moving along. Uh, and when the president mentioned logging, they knew exactly what he meant. Republicans want to put new roads into the old growth of Tongass National Forest, the crown jewel of the national forest system. You know, we're, uh, we're very much against that. And I would say first that there's nobody in this town that a mile of road here or there would benefit more than me. Gordon Chu runs a father-son timber operation. So you built this yourself, the whole house? Yep. And while he believes yep. old growth spruce and cedar can be carefully harvested one tree at a time, he's terrified of a move back to the clear cutting days of old when ancient ecosystems were turned into paper. We're not gonna be grinding up trees for paper anymore. That's yeah, not in my watch. <laughs> when you build a road, you don't know what's gonna come down the road. and. Mm. The reason that you would build a million dollar a mile road is to extract resources big time. Former Mayor Art Bloom tells me the roadless rule is a result of decades of negotiation to protect a place that soaks up more carbon dioxide than anywhere else in America. You can never have this again, uh, you know, once you cut it. Right. It's going to come back as an even aged stand that needs to be managed. And that's you know, a plantation, not a forest. Then it's a plantation. And that won't support the wildlife that this supports. This just into CNN, bears do poop in the woods. And the bears in these woods poop salmon, the most incredible fertilizer, the kind of fertilizer that grows cathedrals like this, and these days also fuels a multi-billion dollar fishing and tourism industry. So in Alaska, if you're gonna talk about cutting down 500 year old trees, even if you're the president, you're gonna make some fishermen really angry. What's your reaction? That's one of shock and dismay, I guess, uh, you know, after all the work that we put in to keep this area roadless and keep this as pristine as we possibly can. And would you characterize yourself as sort of a tree-hugging liberal? No, not at all. <laughs> not a tree-hugging liberal at all. And the governor and, and uh, the president, you know, this is what I'm saying. Do not, do not do this to us. We need to keep this place intact as much as we can. Oh, and Captain Tuck wants me to remind you, these are your trees, America, and any new roads would be built with your tax dollars. Bill Weir, Tenneke Springs, Alaska.